and Ian Castleberry joining us. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing okay. How are you? Buddy, I am hanging in there. Um, <laughs> I am hanging in there. Alone in the uh, mothership, and I've got a computer that's just being a real brat right now. I've tried to send it to timeout. It flipped me the bird. I don't know what to do. I'm calling computer services. I've had it. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but we got a lot of baseball to get to. And as always, Ian, thank you. Ian with Barrett Sports Media and just knows his cookies left and right with baseball. Football, of course, is with us uh, Thursdays as well. Our uh, baseball update today is presented by Blue Mountain Pizza, Main Street in Weaverville. All right, Ian, let's start with this. The uh, Major League Baseball Players Association in the beginning stages of unionizing minor league players. Ian, what would that look like? Like higher pay, better travel conditions, something else, much more? All of the above. I mean, hopefully it's set a bar for, for higher pay, travel conditions, living conditions, just working conditions. You know, like are, are there suitable workout facilities, locker rooms, clubhouses? Uh, are, are they getting the nutrition they need uh, in, in these minor league ballparks? This is long overdue, but I guess this was – kind of what was sold when a couple of years ago when Major League Baseball decided to shrink the minor leagues and reduce the number of affiliates. And I think the promise of doing that, eliminating all these other minor league teams from affiliation, was that if there are fewer minor league teams and fewer minor league players under their purview, that they would be able to better take care of them. Um, that has been slow in progress. And there's an organization, uh, Advocates for uh, Minor League Players, which is really driving, taking the initiative here uh, in making or, or pushing for a unionization from the, the Major League Baseball Players Association. Curiously, the MLBPA, they went ahead and made this decision, but didn't really inform the current membership. And it sounds like maybe at least some current union members are a little bit surprised because you're talking about going from, you know, a, a membership of 1,200 players and adding possibly 5,000 minor leaguers uh, to that. Now, th this is dependent on whether or not the players vote to, the minor league players vote to unionize. Uh, they're being given uh, authorization cards that would allow them to participate in an election for becoming members of the union. And if 30% of the minor leaguers vote for union representation, Major League Baseball uh, will acknowledge or, or at least try, try to recognize them as a union. But if 50% of the minor league player body votes for union representation, Major League Baseball is obligated to recognize the minor leaguers uh, as part of their union as per uh, the National Labor Relations Board. Boy, I can't imagine any minor leaguer who gets a paycheck every couple of weeks and, and rides seven hours on a bus to play baseball uh, would be all about unionizing. Don't you, do you think it's going to go that way, Ian? I can't imagine them not unionizing. I mean, for a higher pay, if no other reason. I mean, currently on minor league teams, the only people, the only players who are represented by the union are players that are on 40 man rosters. So maybe first round draft picks, guys who sign major league contracts, like, you know. Uh, long-time Asheville Tourist fans, you know, thinking about players like David Dahl or Brendan Rogers or Kyle Freeland, like they probably were members of the union and had more in terms of minimum pay. But now, I mean, a, a single-A player uh, at the Asheville Tourist level, if they're not in the union, uh, their minimum pay starts at $500 a week. So as we've said many times for, you know, people who think that even minor league players are out there, you know, earning big bucks, that's just simply not the case. Yeah, I, I know. Everyone thinks it just trickles down to the minor leagues, and guess what? It does not. Wow, this is going to be, uh, I think, fascinating to watch. Is, is this the first time I, I can recall of this getting to this point, uh, unionizing uh, minor league players? Is, is that true for you, Ian? Yeah, yeah. And again, I think it's because the player body has shrunk uh, so much. You know, there have been lawsuits. Major League Baseball had to settle, uh, uh, pay out $185 million, you know, for lower wages and terrible conditions. But more and more attention is being drawn to this, certainly by uh, uh, baseball media, but now you're getting uh, you know, people who, who pay attention to labor uh, relations and issues paying attention to this as well. And, you know, we're kind of seeing this throughout culture or, or the workplace in general, you know, organizations like people who like work for Google want to unionize uh, Facebook. I mean, we're seeing this in the tech industry and, and in other industries where uh, the workforce 
wants to unionize and, and get the benefits that come from banding together and getting a fair fair wages, fair treatment, fair benefits yeah. for management. I mean, this you know, bet you go back to the early days, right? Over the turn of the well, you go back to the early 1900s, right? When um, you know the, the working conditions. There's a reason um, some a lot of workers began to unionize in the early um, you know 20th century. And that is because working conditions were crappy. And let's face it, big time businessmen, I'm done giving them the benefit of the doubt. You know, I think it's great that um, employees want to unionize. I know the nurses at HCA uh, have been through difficulty doing that. And HCA has been, you know, pretty horrid in, in terms of letting that happen. They don't want that to happen. And But I, I think sometimes when you get into a certain situation at work, workers deserve those protections. So we'll see where that goes, man. It's going to be real interesting coming up. All these topics are. It's kind of like we're talking about them now, but we could be uh, swinging back around and revisiting these before you know it, including Justin Verlander. Astros ace leaves yesterday's start with a, a calf injury. Ian, how serious or non-serious is this injury? To be determined, Verlander is undergoing an MRI exam today to determine uh, the seriousness of the injury in the calf, and those results have not been announced yet. The, it was termed as discomfort. Uh, Verlander uh, reportedly uh, felt a twinge in, in his calf. He was running to, to cover first base in the fourth inning, or I'm sorry, third inning yesterday, uh, Astros game against the Orioles. But no word on how serious it is. Uh, Dusty Baker, the Astros manager, was mostly saying, well, you know, thank God it's not his arm, at least. So if, there, if there's silver lining or if there's good news with this bad news, it's that the calf and not his, his arm, but, you know, everything kind of works in sync, right? If, if Verlander were to compensate in any way for a calf injury, that could end up affecting his arm. And it's his right calf, so that, that's Ooh, the calf yeah. that, you know, the, 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 the leg that he Push pushes on. off on, on the pitching rubber. My guess is that uh, Verlander maybe misses a start. Now, he's been talked about this last week with Noah Syndergaard, uh, how the Angels have been kind of handling his workload by uh, pitching him every five or six days uh, in, in a six-man rotation. Uh, the Astros have been doing the same thing with Justin Verlander uh, coming back from Tommy John's surgery also and uh, getting a little more rest than he had been between each start throughout his career. And obviously the results uh, have been spectacular. He's 16-3, 184 ERA, uh, 154 strikeouts in, in 152 innings, 24 starts. So this has obviously worked. Maybe he'll have to miss a start. Maybe this is something that costs Verlander the opportunity to win uh, 20 games, but I think the Astros would rather have a uh, healthy Verlander uh, ready for the postseason. Uh, agreed, for sure. Ian Castleberry with the Wise Guys with Barrett Sports Media. And, of course, it is our uh, baseball update for this Monday, presented today by Blue Mountain Pizza Main Street in Weaverville. All right, Ichiro and Willie Mays, honored by the Mariners and Mets, respectively. Ichiro inducted into the M's Hall of Fame. Let's start there. He had quite a moving speech. Uh, I did not realize the fondness and, and respect that he had for Ken Griffey Jr. This And all this for a guy that really didn't say much during his playing career. He, he let his actions do the talking. Yeah, that's always been kind of one of the uh, legends or uh, rumors about Ichiro, urban legends maybe, is that he really can speak English quite fluently, but chooses, you know, doesn't really want to deal with the media. So, you know, he, he still worked with, with a translator and, and acted throughout most of his career like uh, maybe he didn't uh, completely understand English. And, and you know, to be fair, maybe he's still, you know, as a second language, maybe it's still not something he was completely comfortable yeah. with, uh, even though he played 19 seasons in the major leagues. But, you know, maybe he wasn't comfortable with how it could be interpreted. But, you know, there have been legends, really, of, of Ichiro when he's on the All-Star team of giving these fiery, profanity-filled speeches uh, in the American League clubhouse before the game to fire up the team. And, you know, everybody in the clubhouse kind of turning to him. And so not only like, I didn't know he knew English, but I didn't know he knew all those swear words uh, <laughs> and, and, and things like that. But uh, as you said, the, the video is available online. If you want to watch uh, the induction for each row into the Mariners Hall of Fame, it is a very touching speech. As you said, he, he uh, paid tribute to, to Ken Griffey Jr., Dave Niehaus, the Mariners broadcaster. I mean, somebody who spent so long uh, and is so beloved by, uh, by Seattle and the Mariners fan base. It, it really was. Uh, a touching moment, 
a great moment for Ichiro, a great moment for the Mariners, and a good warm-up for uh, when Ichiro is eligible for the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2025. Yeah, it's coming, man. Meanwhile, Willie Mays' career ended quietly with the Mets, but I wonder, Ian, if his impact as a New York Giant may have also played into this honor. It almost certainly did. The Mets owner at the time when, when Willie Mays played for the Mets uh, in 1972, 1973, Joan Payson, she, she was a fan of the New York Giants and went back to, she was a member of the New York Giants board. And she was the one person who voted no when the team uh, decided to move to San Francisco. And when uh, Mays was available, even though he was clearly at the end of his career, I mean, Mays, is, his Mets career is sort of a cautionary tale about any player who hangs on too long, right? You know, you yeah. see the, the footage of him kind of stumbling around and falling in, in center field, certainly not what most of us remember about Willie Mays, but Payson told Willie Mays, you are going to be the last New York Mets to ever wear number 24. But uh, unfortunately, Payson died before Mays retired, and here we are. It's gone on for 50 years until finally the Mets, under owner Steve Cohen here, decided that it was time for the Mets to retire Willie Mays' number, and it was sort of a surprise moment. Uh, during an old-timers day that they revealed that number 24 was going to be uh, retired by the Mets. Uh, Willie Mays was not in attendance for, for this ceremony, 91 years old, but I think he also underwent hip replacement surgery recently, so wasn't Jeez. able to make the trip. But uh, kind of a cool, you know, how many, only, Willie Mays only played for two teams, right? So for uh, one of them, uh, the, obviously the Giants, they retired his number. And uh, two years for the Mets, even if they weren't great, Although in 1973, they, the Mets did uh, go to the World Series, losing to the Oakland Athletics. But Mays only played for one other team, so uh, why not retire his number? Hey, agreed. Look, you know, it's your team, and, and that's the thing. Well, yeah, he, he slowed down, definitely. Uh, he was at the end of his career, wanted to come back to New York. And, uh, hey, you know what? He's one of those guys. You want to retire his number. If he played six, game with you, six games with you. He's an all-time great. He's Willie Mays. And uh, I'm with I'm with them on that. 91 years of age. Oh my goodness. Ian Castleberry on the DC Crease from Jewelers Wise Lines. Our baseball update presented today by Blue Mountain Pizza, Main Street in Weaverville. So Mickey Mantle card sells for 12.6 million dollars. Hey James, thanks for the heads up on that. Ian, it's a baseball card. Do we know who laid out that kind of money? We do not. The the uh, buyer of this card uh, chose to stay anonymous. I bet. Uh, 12.6 million, uh, for, yeah, 1952 tops Mickey Mantle baseball card. And, and if you see pictures of the card uh, online, I mean, b- back then baseball cards, they were kind of works of art. You know, they weren't just photos. Like this is sort of a, what appears to be a painted uh, image of Mickey Mantle. It is kind of a work of art. I mean, it was the size of a baseball card, but if it was bigger, like a print, this is something you could see putting on, on your wall, but, uh, <laughs> for 12 point <laughs> you want million, million dollars. Dollar uh, an anonymous buyer from Rye, New York, uh, obviously with a whole lot of money to spend, uh, to spare. You know, baseball cards, uh, for a few years, they dwindled in popularity, weren't as collectible, people weren't as into them. But uh, maybe this happened before the pandemic, but certainly during the pandemic when everybody was locked down. The interest in baseball cards and, and collecting and finding them and acquiring them really seemed to go up, and that has not as we continue to return to normal. I mean, perspective, there are ultra-wealthy people who have mansions that cost $12.5 million. This guy paid for just one baseball card that same amount. That is just, wow, that is just mind-blowing. Uh, hopefully he contributes to the community. <laughs> you know, in other words, hopefully, uh, yeah. Oh, and also, the guy who, who had the, the Mickey Mantle baseball card, who, who sold it to this anonymous buyer, his name is Anthony Giordano, he bought that card in 1991 for $50,000, so that's Ooh. quite a profit. Yeah, quite a return on investment there. Nice, nice. Bravo to him. That's a home run deal for sure. Ian Castleberry with the Wise Guys on the D.C. Creaseman Jewelers Wise Lines, presented by Blue Mountain Pizza. Closing in on the final month of the season, Ian, Cardinals Paul Goldschmidt is a favorite to win the National League MVP. And, you know, he came to St. Louis after eight seasons in Arizona and eight solid seasons in Arizona, but yet in St. Louis, Paul just seems to be getting better over time. This season, same with Albert Pujols. You know, McGuire way before them and, and other players in between. Um, what is it about St. Louis, the Cardinals, Bush Stadium, that players kind of, you know, some players can receive a, a career boost or even a career revival? 
Yeah, some people, some baseball fans might roll their eyes at this because you always hear about, you know, the best fans of baseball, but then especially online, you see maybe a darker side of that, the so-called best fans in baseball that are really quite mean to uh, opposing players, media, uh, fans, uh, et cetera. But I don't know. Have you been to a game in St. Louis? I uh, have. Or? Oh, it's a great, yeah. Okay, so you know, and, and the listeners who, who have attended a game in St. Louis, it, I mean, it's close to a college football atmosphere. It's special. It, it's unlike any other. Uh, I mean, I haven't been to every major league ballpark, but I, I remember just being in St. Louis and, and thinking, wow, I, I mean, everybody's dressed in red. There's tailgating. I mean, the downtown practically shuts down. And, and just the love and the knowledge that the fans have for the players, I think there's a comfort level that comes from that. And Paul Goldschmidt, as you mentioned, he's not the first player who had a career elsewhere and then came to St. Louis and, and, and chose and, and fell in love with the place and chose to stay there. Maybe most notably Mark McGuire after being uh, traded there from the Oakland Athletics. But, you know, there's Matt Holiday, Jason Hayward, Jim Edmonds, uh, several players. Uh, there, there's probably several others that, that I'm not thinking of, but he's like Nolan Arenado, uh, Goldschmidt's teammate right now. Yeah came to St. Louis and really settled into a comfort zone, fell in love with the place. And, of course, they are a fantastic organization in terms of development, coaching, uh, analytics, and so forth. But, uh, yeah, Paul Goldschmidt, he got off to a slow start in his Cardinals career. He hit 260 his first season there. And then uh, his second season was uh, the COVID-shortened year. But the past two seasons, he's right back to where he normally is, you know, 30-plus home runs, 35-plus home runs, 100 plus RBI, uh, and right now he leads the league in RBI. He also leads the league uh, in, in batting average, in on-base percentage, and slugging. So he is on pace to win a Triple Crown, uh, which we have not seen. Uh, you know, before. Miguel Cabrera uh, did it a few years ago for the Detroit Tigers, but prior to that it had been, what, I think 30 years or, or so uh, yeah. when Carl Yastrzemski did it. For the Red Sox, so just yeah, an outstanding season for for Paul Goldschmidt, who uh, traditionally I think has been one of the underrated, under uh, recognized players uh, in Major League yeah. Baseball, but truly just one of the best hitters in baseball over his career. Awesome, Ian. Thank you so much. Okay, talk to you next week and, and, and enjoy your holiday. Thanks, buddy. You too. There you have it, Ian Castleberry, presented by Blue Mountain Pizza, Main Street in Weaverville.